From ancient civilizations to medieval kingdoms to our own modern society, conspiracy theories abound about those in control keeping powerful secrets from the people, from all of us. And while the allegations may vary, the overarching questions remain the same. What are they hiding? Why are they hiding it? And where is it hidden? Secret government warehouses. Where are they? And what secrets do they hold? You can't apply federal laws to a non-existent place. Tonight, an investigation to find out. How do people get in here? We'll travel the world looking for answers. From powerful Washington insiders. Could there be military bases we don't know about? At an abandoned military base in Montauk, New York, with investigator Richard Dolan. We're starting to see the disturbances already. In the skies above the legendary Area 51 in Nevada, with researcher Glenn Campbell. Helicopter 966 here, hotel. You familiar with that restricted airspace? Three miles to your west. All the way across the ocean to perhaps the biggest repository of history on Earth, the Vatican. Can we go into the actual archive now? Our investigation will reveal shocking revelations about secret government experiments on U.S. citizens. We were making human guinea pigs out of civilians. Cover-ups about the existence of UFOs. I couldn't tell them what I was done because it was top secret. Potential evidence from a secret base that may provide proof the government has been hiding the truth about extraterrestrial life for decades. You're clearly not human. It's so unusual. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. We'll speak to informants who divulge details about what's hidden and where. There's thousands and thousands of underground tunnels. And for the first time on network TV, bring you footage purportedly smuggled out of Area 51 of an extraterrestrial. Travel with us on a global expedition to find the truth about secret government warehouses. Secret government warehouse. It's a concept portrayed in pop culture that has intrigued audiences around the world for generations. What is this place? Officially, K39 Triple Z on the North American grid. But I like to think of it as America's attic. In the sci-fi series Warehouse 13, two secret service agents are sent to a classified location in the middle of the desert. There, they are told they must protect a mysterious government facility full of historical artifacts that have potentially catastrophic paranormal powers. What you're supposed to do is hunt down whatever is threatening to ruin the world's day and neutralize it and bring it here. You gotta snag it and back it and tag it. It may seem like a far-fetched idea, but we know there are locations around the world where governments are hiding things. On military bases, in government archives, in underground bunkers. Many of them pertain to national security. But are there other deep secrets inside these restricted areas? What are they doing in Fort Knox or in Area 51? What are they doing in the Vatican that I can't go in and see? The mere fact of refusing to let people in makes the people on the outside question why are they being shut out and what is actually happening in that secret area or secret meeting. Are there facilities we don't even know about hiding things we should know about? Some say yes. I believe that there are large numbers of underground facilities throughout this world, a large number of Warehouse 13 type facilities. Everything's in its little compartment, buried away very, very secretly. Whether it deals with mind control or UFOs or maybe secret biological weapons or what have you, uh, secrecy is the norm, not the exception. To answer these questions, we began our investigation in Washington, D.C. We've come to talk with John Podesta, former chief of staff to President Clinton, and a longtime advocate for government transparency to get an inside perspective on just how extensive government secrecy may be. 
Has the government, in, in your knowledge, ever gone too far in keeping something secret? I mean, of course the government can go too far and keep it secret, and those habits kind of die hard. We just need to be uh, observant to ensure that that the public gets the maximum information that, that, that we can provide it. Is there a sense sometimes that the American public can't handle this information? People who are classifying information think the American public can't really handle it or uh, don't need to know it. But I think over the long term, that's really dangerous. I think the American public can handle the truth. But how much don't we know as a society? <laughs> there are sensitive operations that are kept secret that is critical to the success uh, of those operations. Uh, but having said that, there's a lot that's swept into that zone, which for reasons that really are not about security but could be done because if the public knew they wouldn't want it being done in their name one of the biggest sources of speculation is the existence of still classified ufo files why has the u.s not been more forthcoming opened up more information about ufo sightings either proving or, or disproving i think that's a question that i ask myself i mean is there something really in there that the american people couldn't really be made available to maybe you know maybe it'll seem whatever the government was doing at the time might seem a little silly in retrospect but so what i mean i think the public has a right to know that while the U.S. government still keeps UFO documents stashed away at a government facility somewhere, other countries are finally coming clean. In 2008, the U.K. declassified its UFO records. And for the first time, witnesses, including members of the U.S. military, have been able to publicly come forward with their stories. I couldn't tell them what I was done because it was top secret. Milton Torres is a retired U.S. fighter pilot. In 1957, while stationed in the U.K., a strange assignment came over his radio. They had informed me that this was going to be an active firing mission. Then they said, this is an unidentified flying object. We want you to shoot this thing down. When Torres reached the designated coordinates, a giant object appeared on his radar screen. It was doing maneuvers that I couldn't follow. It would stop and then took off right angles. I got in, well, within 20 seconds to go, when all of a sudden it just disappeared. I mean, it took off something like 10 times the speed of sound. This is faster than anything we have on the, on the drawing board. Well, I was af af afraid for my life. Torres returned to base and was ordered to never reveal what he saw in the air. They said that this mission has been declared top secret. You're not to discuss this with anyone, not your wife, not your commander, not anyone. If you violate top secret uh, instructions, you can go to jail. To this day, Torres does not know what it was he saw on his radar screen, but he has his suspicions. I don't think we're alone. And whoever built that machine knew a hell of a lot more than I did. Could stories like Torres's still be under lock and key within the U.S. government's UFO files? Even some politicians believe the answer is yes. Former Arizona Governor Fife Symington, who witnessed the unexplained Phoenix Lights, believes it was a UFO and that it was covered up by the U.S. government. I witnessed a, a massive delta-shaped craft that silently navigated over North Phoenix. We want the United States government to stop perpetuating the myth that all UFOs can be explained away in down-to-earth and conventional terms. And Ohio Congressman Dennis Kucinich says he witnessed a UFO as well. Yeah. Congressman Kucinich, did you see a UFO? Uh, I, I did. It was unidentified flying object, okay? It's like it's unidentified. I saw something. Does the government know something about alien technology that it isn't telling us? I am convinced that our government has physical evidence, has answers, has information pertaining to the actual existence of UFOs. Many believe if there is evidence of UFOs, it is held deep underground here at the remote Air Force Base in Nevada, commonly known as Area 51. 
The heavily guarded base is so shrouded in security and mystery, it wasn't even acknowledged by the government until 1994. Even today, it is hard to sort out who officially oversees it. We filed a written request for access, but weeks went by with no reply. So we decided to call. We put in an official request to film at the government facility at Groom Lake, also known as Area 51. I do think that there is some merit to be able to get onto a base such as yours and see what actually is there and what kind of programs taxpayer dollars are paying for. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. You said that you would be um, willing to look at our request. While we wait for a reply, we focus on another location steeped in lore. Camp Hero State Park in Montauk, New York. Author and investigator Richard Dolan heads there to look into claims of covert mind control, time travel, and teleportation experiments conducted by the government in underground facilities. I want to find some kind of evidence to show that there may have been substantial underground activity around here. If we get that, maybe we can have another jumping off point for a further investigation. From 1942 to 1982, Camp Hero was a military base where servicemen were often on the lookout for enemy planes or submarines. But according to Stuart Swerdlow, the base also had a darker side. He claims that from 1970 to 1983, the government experimented on him at Camp Hero as part of a program he calls the Montauk Project. It was uh, actually begun uh, as a project for mind control, programming, genetic manipulation, and esoteric weaponry. Part of the uh, Montauk Project involved time travel or opening up uh, dimensional doorways from one point to another point. Swerdlow says he, along with thousands of other people, were taken off the streets and from their homes and brought to an underground facility at Camp Hero. The Montauk base on the surface was a derelict or old Air Force base. Underneath, there were nine levels where the operations took place. There were centers where they would keep people uh, sequestered. It may sound far-fetched, but the U.S. government conducting secret experiments on Americans without their permission is not. It has hidden programs from its citizens in the past and stashed away or destroyed the evidence. Like the medical research done for 40 years on poor black men in Tuskegee, Alabama. They were secretly mistreated for syphilis by the government in an effort to see how they would react. It's only one of the insidious programs uncovered over time. At the height of the Cold War, we now know that the United States military was using the American people as guinea pigs, basically releasing radiation into populated areas to see how fast radiation would spread. The military was experimenting on people without their permission, injecting people with plutonium, which is, of course, one of the most toxic chemicals known to science. They even gassed the New York subway system. But perhaps the most shocking programs involve mind control experiments carried out from the 1950s to the 1970s. The most infamous among them was MKUltra. MKUltra was a top secret project to see whether or not mind control was a possibility. The military and the CIA began to look into the possibility of LSD, mind-altering hallucinogenic drugs that could brainwash people. Well, the consequences of this, of course, are enormous because this was uncharted territory. People went crazy. We were destroying people's minds. Retired Army officer Michael Bailey says he was one of the military's test subjects. And they said the tests were safe. There was nothing to be scared of. Bailey was stationed at the Edgewood Arsenal Military Base in Maryland in the mid-1970s after volunteering for what he thought was a program to test uniforms and equipment. They explained that we were going to be testing equipment of the battlefields of the future, and it sounded exciting. But in fact, Bailey says he and hundreds of other soldiers were injected with LSD and other harmful drugs or exposed to dangerous gases to see how they would behave. 
We obtained this once restricted training video shot by the military which shows some of the effects of the experiments conducted on their own men stationed at Edgewood. Six and a half hours after exposure time, the confused volunteer needed help as he attempted to traverse part of an obstacle course. At this point, hallucinations and other mental disturbances were evident. Looking back, Bailey believes his government betrayed him. You trusted the government, you trusted the army. It was a bunch of lies. There was a lot of harm done at Edward Arson. More than 100 of these mind control experiments were conducted at military bases, in hospitals, and at leading universities like Princeton and Harvard. But these programs had some disastrous consequences. There were a number of suicides, a number of unsuccessful suicides. One man who had been dosed with LSD actually tried to commit suicide on his front lawn in front of his children and was in a what, what's commonly called a flashback state. The truth behind MK Ultra was only revealed in the mid-1970s. All the classified documents were ordered to be destroyed by the head of the CIA. But about 10 boxes of financial records were overlooked, and a small portion of the dark truth was uncovered. The thing about MKUltra, we have to remember, is that we have very little information about the specifics of the programs, and that is because most of those records were destroyed. Without comprehensive records about who exactly was involved, some speculate that MK Ultra victims may have changed the course of history. The assassin of Robert F. Kennedy, Sirhan Sirhan, has been speculated for a long time to have been a mind control victim. At Harvard, it's interesting to note one of the students involved in the uh, experiments there was the Unabomber. If experiments like MK Ultra took place without public knowledge, is it possible the Montauk Project is another example of a government program that to this day remains classified? We only learned about MKUltra by accident. It could so easily be the case that had all those records been properly destroyed, to this day, all MKUltra would be rumor. When I think about that in connection with something like Montauk, it makes me think that it's just possible that the Montauk Project remains rumor because simply the guys running the security did a better job than they did with MK Ultra. Could the U.S. government have been conducting experiments inside secret underground bunkers at this retired military base? That's what Richard Dolan is hoping to find out. If the claims about the Montauk Project are true, that'll change everything about what we think we know about this world. And I have to say, if you're going to have a secret program, then Montauk is a great place to have it in a lot of ways. It's very remote. I think that it's possible that there has been some strange activity going on under there. Since the base is now a state park, we ask park officials for permission to access any underground areas. But they said they are not aware of any tunnel system in Camp Hero. Dolan has heard otherwise. I'm told that there are interesting structures in this area. Tunnels I've read about. I want to see something. And what he finds may change what we think about the Montauk Project. What the hell is this? What is this? Ahead, I'll join Dolan at Montauk, where we'll use cutting-edge technology to look below the ground. There is something here that uh, could be an underground structure. Later, I'll examine potential evidence that could prove the U.S. military has been covering up the existence of extraterrestrial life for years. Could this be the smoking gun that we're all looking for? But first, I'm heading to Rome, Italy, to try to get past the Vatican gates and into one of the most mysterious repositories in the world, the Vatican Secret Archives. No one knows exactly what secrets are in the Vatican Archives. They are so huge. All this when Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. Investigation.
investigation into the world's most secretive warehouses brings us here to Rome, Italy, home to the smallest sovereign state in the world, but also one of the most influential, Vatican City. It is the headquarters of the Catholic Church and its one billion followers. And although its government rules over only 108 acres of land, the reach of its power has extended around the world. The Vatican is an intriguing place because it's the oldest continuously existing organization on the face of the earth. You can trace it back 2,000 years. The Vatican's role in shaping history is well documented, and some of it, like its support of the arts, is proudly on display here. It's one of, if not the greatest, repositories of art, history, tradition, theology, and written material in the world. It is a treasure trove. Behind me are the hallowed halls of Vatican City, and somewhere deep inside, the Vatican's secret archives. 52 miles of shelves holding thousands of documents. It is perhaps the richest repository of history in the world, and yet it is off limits to almost everyone. For years, scholars and citizens alike have wondered what's hidden inside. Is the Vatican guarding powerful secrets? No one knows exactly what secrets are in the Vatican archives. They are so huge, and scholars are rather limited in, in what they're allowed to look at. I don't know that we'll ever know everything that they have there. The secrecy and lack of access have stoked the interest of academics, writers, and even Hollywood. In the novel and later movie, The Da Vinci Code, it is speculated that the church might be hiding the truth about the bloodline of Jesus Christ. While in the movie Angels and Demons, an ancient document stored inside the archives holds the key to preventing a secret society called the Illuminati from exacting revenge on the Vatican. This way, please. The archives in the movie is a vast, highly secure, state-of-the-art facility filled with millions of documents. The chambers are hermetic vaults. Oxygen is kept at lowest possible levels. There's a partial vacuum inside. Could the real Vatican secret archives be a facility like this one? And could there be documents inside pertaining to explosive subject matter the church may want hidden? Like prophecies about the apocalypse, evidence of a supposed bloodline of Christ, exorcisms, or secret societies. Information that might alter our understanding not just of the church, but of history. Recent discoveries tell us yes. Vatican archivist Barbara Frale found a document buried inside that is key to understanding the Pope's role in the execution of the legendary Knights Templar. Many people believe that Pope Clement V led the investigation into the Templar Knights and disavowed them and led to their downfall. You have found a document. What does that document tell us about the story? In 2001, we found in the Vatican's secret archive an original parchment belonging to Pope Clement V, who asked for a secret hearing for the masters of the Templar order, absolving them, as he was convinced they weren't heretics. Now we know that the Church never condemned the Templar order and that it was the King of France's act of violence and abuse to cause the closure of the order. Because this document was filed in the archives in a strange way, its existence remained unknown for hundreds of years. This makes me wonder, could there be other documents about other important pieces of history that have not been found? There are still millions of documents which are yet undiscovered in the Vatican secret archive. So what else might be hidden unintentionally or intentionally inside? Much of the speculation about what is intentionally withheld is about end-of-the-world prophecies, like the famous Third Secret of Fatima. It is one of the most well-known and important prophecies to Catholics around the world. 
The story goes that in 1917, a vision of the Virgin Mary appeared several times to three small children near Fatima, Portugal. Today, a site where thousands of the faithful flock each year. During her visits, the vision is said to have shared three secrets about the future. But the Vatican only revealed the first two. The first one was a vision of hell. The second one had to do with the end of World War I and the beginning of another great war shortly thereafter if Russia wasn't converted to Catholicism. But the third secret was with hell, leaving some, like Fatima researcher Christopher Ferrara, to wonder what it said. In 1960, for reasons unknown, the Vatican let it be known that the secret was going to be placed under seal forever. But on June 26, 2000, the Vatican finally relented under mounting pressure and published a vision. The announcement of a third secret made international news. For years, people speculated that the third secret was actually a prophecy about the end of the world. Today, before half a million followers, a Vatican official revealed the secret. The vision showed a bishop dressed in white, shot down by a burst of gunfire. According to the Vatican, the prophecy of the third secret was fulfilled on May 13, 1981. That's when the Pope interpreted as the bishop in white was shot here on St. Peter's Square as he waved to the faithful from his vehicle. But there are those who don't believe that explanation. They believe the real third secret may still be hidden inside the Vatican and that it contains an even more startling revelation. A revelation about a global crisis. The secret involves a crisis in the church and some kind of apocalyptic scenario that affects every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. I've been granted rare permission to enter the archives with our cameras to see what's inside. The first thing I'm shown is kept in the head archivist's office and it exemplifies the kind of rich history that's stored here. Explain what this document is we're looking at. This is the letter addressed to Clement VII from the Lords of the English Parliament, in which they ask the Pope to annul the wedding between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. This led to the Church of England breaking away from the Catholic Church, did it not? See. But not all the documents get such a grand display. Most of them are buried deep inside the main archives facility. The archives secretary general, Luca Carboni, has agreed to meet with me and take me into the heart of it all. Can we go into the actual archive now? We go to see the storage of the, the storage, archives. Where the, archives the storage. Are. at the main facility and I'm instantly overwhelmed by the massive number of files that are before us. We are standing amid the history of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but this is also an important part of the history of the world, isn't it? The Vatican Archives is uh, important in the world, uh, unique because uh, we preserve a continuing chronological space uh, of over 800 years from 1198 onwards. Documents as varied as records of medieval families to letters from the brilliant astronomer Galileo, who had famous battles with church leaders of his time, live on these shelves. So you have a correspondence from Galileo. We have uh, a simple letter to a cardinal uh, from uh, Galileo. So that, that's Galileo's signature. Uh, Galileo's signature uh, from Florence in dating of uh, December 1628. There, there is just so much here. Is it, is it possible that there are things here that even the archivists don't know about? Mm, yes. Uh, each day we discover something new or uh, something interesting. When you use the term secret here... Ah, okay. Uh, secret means uh, private. Eh? Secret in this case doesn't mean things that no one can no, see. No, no, no. Only private. Private but off-limits to all but about a thousand researchers handpicked by the Vatican each year. 
It's not hard to imagine how documents can get buried in this vast warehouse, either accidentally or on purpose. The secrets of Fatima, would, would we find something about the secrets of Fatima here? No. Uh, here is not preserved. Uh, if I don't remember, say, uh, if I remember uh, well, it's not here. But then, where is it? Are there other secure places within Vatican City? Even within this facility, there are areas that are restricted, like the parchment room, holding some of the oldest and most important documents. Can scholars and researchers come here? No, no, no. Only the staff of the Vatican Archives. All your parchment are kept here? We preserve uh, 50,000 of single parchment in this room on two floor. The, the air feels different. Is the, is the climate controlled yes, here? Yes, it's uh, under control. And, and what is in here? Here we have the famous uh, Templar trials. The, eh? the three meters of parchment rules. But we can't see it? Eh? No, it's close. There's no doubt that this repository is one of a kind. But the Vatican has not shown us evidence to prove or disprove the rumors of secret documents being stored inside the archives. So we're headed to Montauk, New York, to look for clues into claims of underground mind control and time travel experiments. And later, we're going to some of the most heavily guarded military bases in the U.S. to investigate reports that proof of alien life is stored inside. All this when Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. We're on a quest to uncover the world's most elusive government warehouses and the secrets that may be buried inside. Our investigation returns to Camp Hero State Park in Montauk, New York. We're looking into claims about the so-called Montauk Project. story goes, the radar tower behind me was once the epicenter of the Montauk Project's dangerous mind control experiments, and that nine subterranean levels beneath the tower housed top-secret technology that transported thousands of people through time and space. But do those underground facilities really exist? According to the United States government, there are no underground facilities at Montauk. Um, of course, you have to bear in mind that the United States government does almost certainly have many underground facilities that they don't wish to acknowledge. Author and investigator Richard Dolan has agreed to meet me at Camp Hero to take a closer look. Can we establish there's something underground? The thing that I've been thinking about is it, it's impossible to establish the veracity of the claims of the people themselves, but if we can bring some kind of instrumentation to take a look below the ground, I'm thinking ground-penetrating radar, uh, we might be able to find out one way or the other if there's anything that we can um, notice. At least, at least confirm some parts of the story. According to Stuart Swerdlow, he, along with thousands of others, were brought here to be programmed or mind-controlled. I was subjected to many types of experimentations, interrogations, indoctrinations. I was used in uh, the time travel experimentation. To do this, Swerdlow says he was sequestered in facilities directly beneath the old radar tower. Deep underground, he says, there were nine levels of rooms, and within those rooms was a device called the Montauk chair. Looked kind of like a dental chair that the person would sit on. There would be a headset that would go over them. Uh, there were huge uh, computer banks around that location. And there would be the psychic who would be sitting in the chair and generate thoughts electromagnetically into this device which could be amplified and stored on the computer so that it could be amplified and transmitted. But mind control wasn't the only concept being tested at Montauk, Swerdlow says. According to him, they were also experimenting with time travel and teleportation using strange technology. It's like a huge mirror frame. And in the frame, there is technology that creates vibrational frequencies that can match points in time and space. And you literally walk through 
and that is how they transported people from Montauk. If Swerdlow's claims are true, it would completely change the way we see the world. Up to this point, time travel and teleportation have simply been concepts explored in pop culture, in movies like The Philadelphia Experiment and Back to the Future. But were teleportation and time travel experiments like these taking place at Camp Hero? We asked the military about the existence of these experiments and underground spaces at this former base. After speaking with several different departments and officials, we still didn't get a clear answer. But theoretical physicist Michio Kaku says time travel and teleportation are not possible with current technology. Claims about the Montauk Project talk about teleportation, time travel. But let's be blunt about this. The United States military, the most powerful military on the planet Earth, simply does not have enough energy to bend space and time into knots. Still, we know the government does have a history of experimenting on unwitting Americans, especially with mind control. So we've brought in the latest technology to help us determine if there's anything underground here. Jamie Harmon and Dan Welch are ground-penetrating radar technicians. The technology they have should be able to detect anomalies underground. I know this is ground penetrating radar, but explain to me what you can do with this. Um, this orange box here, this is the radar pulse that's going down into the ground. When they meet something with a different uh, material property, like stone or, or uh, something metal, uh, we'll get a reflection, which will bounce back to the surface. So if you see a man-made uh, tunnel or something, it would, it would show up pretty clearly on that? Mm -hmm. you know, it takes a little interpretation, but it will show up on the screen. Today, the area around the radar tower is completely off-limits, fenced off with warning signs. The park says it's because of concerns about falling debris, but Swordlow says otherwise. The reason there's a fence around the radar tower is because underneath there is the main part of the Montauk base. They don't want people going in there. The entrance is sealed. But the park has granted us rare access to the restricted area surrounding the radar tower, with a stern warning not to get too close to the rusting satellite dish. It's pretty strong reflection. Our time here is limited, so we decide to split into two teams. Dolan goes to do a quick pass with his Geiger counter to see if there are any anomalies around the radar tower. It's basically reading at just under 10, which is very low. When he finds nothing strange, he goes to search for potential entrances into any underground spaces. Meanwhile, our ground-penetrating radar team gets to work surveying the area beneath the tower. Ourselves around here. And right off the bat, we start to get some strange readings. So, yeah, we're starting to see the disturbances already. This is the very beginning of what we're, we were expecting to see for the anomaly. So we know it starts here. Yep, and it's pretty strong. And we're looking at about 10 feet in, in depth. This being the surface here. So it's a very distinct start to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Dolan is canvassing some of the surrounding wooded parts of the park. According to Swerdlow, there's an entire network of underground tunnels throughout the area. On the old base, you do see manhole covers or just even um, entrances that are covered by metal plates. Um, allegedly, some of them, they say, are for sewer systems or rainwater draining and that kind of thing. But those were uh, once escape hatches for the underground area. This is one of the uh, many manholes that's said to be in this area. That's some water. It's a water pipe here. A ladder going down. It looks like it's been backfilled. All right, I'm going to regret this, I'm sure. I want to see how deep this is. I don't know if they could have been designed as a water drainage. Maybe there's a lot of water usage at that facility. Why do you need a ladder going into a, a water drainage hole? Dolan finds several of these uncovered manholes, but they lead no further than seven feet down. So he returns to check on me and the GPR team. 
and we are getting compelling readings. Uh, we did a number of passes right around this area here, and uh, down about 10 feet or so, it looks like we're getting on the surface of, uh, of uh, something interesting. But you're also seeing uh, it's, it's rather flat. Mm -hmm. It does have a nice uh, flat surface to it. So uh, you know, given this area here, the, the topography of this hill, how it slopes down, if something was flat, it might be more evidence that it could be uh, you know, more magnetic. In other words, it appeared that it could be a roof of something that even went below. Sure, could be the top of a, uh, you know, top of an underground chamber. It's uh, the most compelling evidence. So. Well, it's about par for the Montauk mystery because it, it gives us a little bit of something, but not enough to really <laughs> say yes. But here's the deal: it's it's about ten feet below us, and if there are nine levels, apparently we we would only see the top level. That's correct. Yeah. So there's no way of knowing what would be beyond that. The GPR technology has uncovered may be just a first step to determining if there's anything underground. But without the park's permission to start drilling, there's no way to be certain. But that doesn't mean our investigation ends here. We still have one more place to look for proof of underground facilities in the area. The tunnel systems that exist under the town of Montauk and Montauk Manor still exist. These locations have tunnel systems to go towards the Montauk base. We've come to the Montauk Manor, an old hotel built in 1927, to see if we can find these supposed underground tunnels and whether they lead to Camp Hero five miles away. Right. So what is this place? Uh, these are the access tunnels, like the foundation yeah. of the Montauk Manor, uh -huh. and uh, built in 27. And the tunnels go for quite a ways. Jimmy Hackett works at the manor and has been exploring these tunnels for decades. Have you gone through the whole route of this? I've gone through a big portion of it, but there's still some unexplored sections back there that yeah. I haven't been through. Have you ever explored Camp Hero? Yeah, I did. Actually, when we were younger, we played up there while it was actually a working Air Force base. We found, I don't know what you call them, but they were tunnel-like. We'd climb down metal rebar ladders into these square tunnels. Are those the manholes? That no. We're about? These no. are different? Yeah. These are cement square with uh, metal lids. And those are now sealed over? Yes. Yeah, they're, I've heard they were filled with cement. But there are tunnels under Camp Hero. Yes. We start to make our way through these tunnels. They quickly get lower, narrower, and harder to navigate, with no end in sight. No. Well, we can get through here. Can we get through? Watch our heads. Yeah. <laughs> Cobwebs down here. A lot of cobwebs, they just keep it up. Turns around to the right. Oh, great. This could go on forever. Okay. Come on up here and take a look at this. We finally get to a point where it is no longer possible for two people to keep moving forward. He's gone ahead a little bit to see exactly how far it really goes. I can't believe it goes this far. Neither of us can figure out why you would have a crawl space of this length under this building. Richard, can you hear me? My way back here. I couldn't find the end of it. It's, oh, I'm here. It's very, very long. And uh, one end is a dead end, but then it branches off and it goes into several different directions. I could imagine people getting temporarily lost down there anyway. I think as far as, as either of us goes right now? I think so, yeah. These seemingly never-ending tunnels add another dimension to the Montauk mystery and keep the story alive. We may never know the truth about the Montauk Project or about what may have taken place here at Camp Hero. What we do know, of course, is that military bases here in the U.S. and around the world are ideal places to hide classified projects. And that's exactly where we're headed next, to two of the most secretive, heavily guarded military bases in the country. Our first stop is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Could the potential evidence we uncover there prove once and for all the base has been engaged in a cover-up of alien life? He says, forget you ever seen this, forget you ever worked on it, don't talk about it. And later, we'll head for the skies in an effort to get the closest look possible at Area 51, where alien technology and life is said to be stashed away. All this when inside secret government warehouses continues.
Our search for the truth about secret government warehouses has taken us on a global journey. We've been to Montauk, New York to explore allegations of mind control and time travel experiments underneath an abandoned military base. And we've traveled across the Atlantic to delve into the depths of the Vatican secret archives in search of answers to age-old mysteries. As our investigation deepens, we check in at our nation's capital, where we are still looking for answers and access. We made that request via fax four weeks ago, and we haven't heard anything back. We would love an opportunity to go to the facility and tour it. For weeks, we've been calling the Air Force, requesting permission to get inside Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and what may be the most secure military base in the United States, the legendary Area 51. Oh, you've never allowed visitors out there. After phone calls to multiple government agencies, we finally reach an Air Force representative who agrees to review our request one more time. Thank you so much. I would appreciate that. The Pentagon's reluctance to let us into these military bases only fuels our curiosity. Could they be hiding more than military secrets inside? And are there other bases or even warehouses like the one depicted in the sci-fi series Warehouse 13 that we don't even know about? And that is exactly what we do here. Take the unexplained and we just safely tuck it away in this supersized Pandora's box. Washington insider John Podesta says the idea of a central warehouse is a myth. There's, of course, not one single place that, that uh, uh, classified information is distributed ac across the country and across the globe. Could there be military bases we don't know about? Could there be places underground? Well, if we don't know about it, how do we know? <laughs> Officials at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base decline our request for an interview. But we are able to speak with Congressman Michael Turner, who represents the Dayton, Ohio district where the base is located. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is known as the largest Air Force Base in the world. It has over 20,000 people who work inside the fence, largely in research and development. It has been involved in every plane for the military, starting with the Wright Brothers plane, going straight through to stealth. Turner acknowledges Wright-Pat's classified research has inspired theories about extraterrestrial technology stored on base. Whenever you have a base that's 8,000 acres and only 10 planes, um, you know, there's a lot of research and development that's going on, and there's a lot of speculation. Speculation fueled in part by Wright-Pat's role in the infamous Roswell incident of 1947. The government has issued at least four different official explanations about what actually crashed in the New Mexico desert. And while theories may vary, certain facts are indisputable. A declassified FBI memo dated July 8, 1947, indicates the wreckage purporting to be a flying disc was secretly flown 1,500 miles to Wright Field by special plane for examination. After the Roswell incident, Wright-Pat became home to Project Blue Book, an official government investigation into UFOs. I think people who were, were interested in UFOs uh, certainly looked to the Air Force to have some, some kind of greater knowledge about what had occurred than, than merely those who had witnessed them and what their beliefs might have been. The Air Force investigated more than 12,600 UFO sightings. 700 of them remained unexplained when the government terminated the project in 1969. UFO author Donald Schmidt says Blue Book was flawed from the start. The true hardcore cases were going upstairs, were going above Blue Book to something that we'll never know about. Retired Air Force Captain Robert Collins spent 22 years in the military six of them at Wright Pat. I had a top secret uh, SCI or special compartment and in information clearance. Honorably discharged in 1988, Collins says he has come forward because he wants the military to stop covering up the secret UFO research he believes it has been conducting at Wright Pat for decades. 
deals with all the black programs that the Air Force has, including all the classified, uh, super secret uh, reverse engineering programs for UFOs. There are witnesses who support Collins's claim and say they had access to extraterrestrial evidence on the base. According to one account, officials at Wright Pat revealed the Roswell wreckage to an elite group of men from the prestigious Air War College who were sent there on assignment. Among them was a lieutenant colonel named Marion Magruder. He said they were trying to determine whether they were going to make public something that had recently happened. A fighter pilot in the Second World War, Magruder, known by his combat moniker Black Mac, was no stranger to military operations. But this mission was unlike any other. It was so highly classified, he only revealed it to his family 50 years later when he was dying. He said, uh, I, I want to tell you that we're not alone. Magruder spoke vividly of a shocking encounter with an extraterrestrial being. I had quite a bit of empathy for him, and he said he was more humanoid than he than alien, but he had a much larger head, larger eyes, long slender arms, uh, thin little legs. He appeared to my father to be very sad. Magruder struggled silently with what he saw until the last days of his life. My father said we killed him because of the experiments and stuff. That had a, an incredible impact upon him. And it may be that his memories weren't all that haunted him. There would be some people come to visit him to discuss that situation with him. Whoever it was, and I never knew who it was, uh, was very interested in making sure that secret was kept. The Air Force referred us to its 1985 fact sheet that addresses persistent UFO rumors. It says there are not now, nor ever have been, any extraterrestrial visitors or equipment on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Yet, over the years, questions have grown. Suspicions sparked by testimony from former employees, including Robert Collins, who says underground facilities are strategically hidden throughout the base. Never find it unless you knew where, where to look. Coming up, reports of a complex labyrinth deep underneath Wright Pat. And physical evidence allegedly from the base that may prove a government cover-up of alien life. I'm too old to worry about my reputation. And later, travel with us to the Nevada desert for an unprecedented investigation into Area 51. If the public ever really knew what happened at Area 51, they'd want to burn the place down. All this and more when Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. We've come to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, to investigate the truth about what may be hidden inside. Is this base ground zero in a government conspiracy to cover up evidence of alien life? Many UFO researchers believe so. They have the proof. They have the physical evidence. To this day, everything still points to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. According to retired Air Force Captain Robert Collins, uh, the next building is 620. These civil engineering drawings show entrances to a massive complex of tunnels and vaults located under the base. Which leads to a set of stairs. Combining data from 25 years of research with information leaked to him by unnamed sources, Collins describes what he believes is under the surface. All these uh, tunnels and vaults are completely independent of anything else in Wright Patterson Air Force Base. 60 feet down below ground. And then there's a limestone rock bed, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 feet thick. So you may be as far down as 70 feet. You're looking at uh, probably the size of a couple football fields at least in, in length. There's roughly four big vaults. They're about 100 by 100 feet in size. They got carpeting on the on the floor of the tunnels and you could drive a pickup truck through. Collins says the most remarkable secret isn't the underground complex itself, 
It's what he says the Air Force was and possibly still is hiding inside. The things that were stored in these uh, vaults were, of course, bodies, alien bodies. All the cryogenic equipment used to support and maintain and preserve those bodies and medical examination tables and uh, biological testing equipment. The Air Force denied our request for an interview with a representative from the base. But local Congressman Michael Turner says plenty of classified information is at Wright Pat, and it's all with good reason. A lot of the things that are going on at Wright Patterson Air Force Base are secrets that need to be protected. There are things that are in development, uh, research that we're doing, possibly for capabilities for us in the future, or even how we're looking at our potential adversaries. A statement issued to us by the base says the evolution of virtually every Air Force aircraft flying today can be traced back to Wright Pat. They tell us current developments include material that can sense and then heal its own cracks, as well as bird and insect-sized aircraft capable of swarming. One of the few reporters allowed on base to investigate the legends of UFOs at Wright Pat is Emmy Award-winning newsman Carl Day. For an awful lot of unanswered questions, and tonight we're going to try and sort out facts from fiction. And they said, well, come on in and look and see if you find anything. This was at the invitation of the Air Force. Aware of reports about underground chambers, Day asked to be escorted to the lowest level of Building 620. The tunnel that I went through was certainly not big enough to drive a truck through, and we had to duck out of these tunnels because they were very low. While Day didn't find hidden tunnels, he uncovered something even more shocking. It was a small mandible, which is a little, the lower jaw of something. In the course of his reporting, Day met a dental technician from a Veterans Affairs Hospital 15 miles outside of Wright Pat, who said he had worked on a strange impression of a mandible brought from the base. At the time, the man was so afraid to tell his story that he didn't reveal his name or face. Never seen anything like this before in, in human or animal. Neither one. Today, at 81 years old, John Mosgrove speaks undisguised for the first time. I'm not going to be around too many more years, and I'd like for this story to be out, you know, because uh, I don't think the federal government is ever going to come out and say, yes, there are aliens and they are visiting us. Mosgrove says that in October of 1979, two uniformed men he recognized as officers from Wright Pat came to the VA hospital to obtain a cast of a dental impression. There was no blood and saliva. It was just dry as a bone. And I noticed right then and there I had something unusual. I thought to myself, my God, what have I got here? When Mosgrove finished the assignment, his boss made it clear not to speak of what he saw ever again. He raised his hand up like this with the impression, looked at me and crushed it and threw it into the trash. And that's when he says, forget you ever seen this, forget you ever worked on it, don't talk about it. The impression was broken, but Mosgrove dug the pieces out of the trash and put it back together so he could duplicate the cast. Convinced the mandible came from a skeleton stored at Wright Pat, Mosgrove gave a copy of the cast to Carl Day to investigate. But the case went cold when nobody Day showed it to could identify its origin. I didn't want anything to happen to it, just in case. So it's in a safe deposit box. And I've got the key. Day agreed to retrieve the mandible from his personal repository. There it is. This is the first time it's ever been shown on national television. I would love to know if this is indeed representative of true aliens' lower jawbone. You can imagine how small the head must have been. 30 years after the cast was made, pressing questions remain. Could this be the smoking gun that we're all looking for? A final proof that indeed we're being visited by aliens? It proves one thing. There's something other than human and animal. Coming up, does this mandible hold the secret to extraterrestrial life? 
A leading dental anthropologist weighs in. And that's not even close. Right. But first, join us in the Nevada desert. Does that make you wonder what's in there that has to be so secret that they kill? As we examine exclusive video that may expose what happens inside the most secretive military base in the United States. When Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. journey leads us to one of the most mysterious military facilities on earth the legendary area 51 area 51 is a black facility which means it was created to deny its very existence you can't even approach it it's so heavily guarded so it's really hard to know exactly what the government is doing government secrecy surrounding area 51 has made the base so notorious that it's even depicted in blockbuster movies like Independence Day. In the film, Area 51 is portrayed as a massive UFO research complex, complete with flying saucers and alien bodies. After repeated requests for access to Area 51 or a representative, we're turned down. May I ask why we're being denied access? The Air Force issued a statement saying the area is used for testing and training for operations critical to the effectiveness of U.S. military forces and the security of the United States. And some specific activities and operations, both past and present, remain classified and cannot be discussed. Undeterred, we hit the road to find out as much as we can without breaking the law. I'm now driving to the Nevada desert a couple hours north of Las Vegas, heading to the legendary Area 51, a place that perhaps holds some of this country's biggest, deepest military secrets. And what exactly goes on there has been the source of a lot of speculation. As local tourism shows, most of the speculation centers on extraterrestrial projects. Reports of warehouses dug deep into the mountainside. There's some sort of earth-moving activity taking place in that area. Where some claim scientists are conducting reverse engineering on alien spacecraft. It was hundreds of thousands of years ahead of our technology. And most shocking of all, potential evidence that may confirm extraterrestrials exist and may have been held on the base. All claims we'll look into in the course of our investigation here. Area 51 has been veiled in secrecy since its inception. Established in 1955 as a covert test site for the U-2 spy plane, its purpose was to hide military projects. It was a place that was preoccupied with maintaining total secrecy. And secrecy then became its mission. The remote desert location, labeled number 51 on this 1950s map, seemed to be the perfect place for a black facility. But as the base infrastructure and activity grew, information began to leak out. U-2 spy plane, the SR-71 spy plane. Various stealth aircraft were all tested at this facility. And everything that we can see from the ground and the air indicates that this base is for aircraft testing. Despite full-scale Air Force operations on site, the government refused to acknowledge its existence. Not just initially, but for 40 years. Area 51 investigator and guide Glenn Campbell has been studying the facility since the early 90s. It was sort of like going to a drive-in movie. You could drive up and look down on the, on the secret base that the government didn't acknowledge. I'm going to meet up with Glenn Campbell. Glenn and I first met up 16 years ago uh, when I came out to this same desert trying to get answers about Area 51. This new point we're heading to is Freedom Ridge. In this report I did back in 1994, we simply drove up a nearby peak and the entire facility was revealed. From our mountain vantage point, Dreamland is a collection of unremarkable buildings. Today, the military has expanded control over land around the base. It's been a long time. <laughs> so getting a good view won't be as easy. What will we be able to see today? 
Well, from the ground, we're not going to be able to see much. And I know you brought some uh, so we, we, we we have satellite photos. Increasingly better satellite imagery over the years. This is Some of the stuff is incredibly good. Look at these runways and things. Uh, it's still the best way to see it is from oh, overhead. Yeah. Yeah, the security of this place is part of the intrigue. That, that's what continues to raise the level of curiosity and, and even, you know, conspiracy theories. The, the security here is intense. When we look place. around, it's a good place to hide. <laughs> you know? it's, a, it's a damn fine place to hide. Area 51 first gained public attention in the late 80s with an explosive claim made by a physicist named Bob Lazar. He said he'd been working on a top secret project to reverse engineer alien spacecraft at a classified location near the base. He says, no, John, he said, I was in it, I touched it, it's real, it's ET, it's nothing that we could have produced. Bob Lazar declined our request to be interviewed for this program, but referred us to his good friend, John Lear, a retired pilot who flew missions for the CIA. I was the guy that exposed Area 51. Lear says he pushed Lazar to do a television interview revealing the government cover-up of alien technology. He said, yeah, just as long as I do it in shadow. The interview took place at Lear's home, and he captured the setup in this exclusive video. Pictures. That's Bob. That's his wife. That's in the interview, Lazar claims to have worked on flying saucers in a secret facility called S-4. So covert, it's camouflaged by a mountain south of Area 51. John Lear describes S-4 as Lazar explained it to him. S-4 is an underground base. It just looks like a slope of a mountain, but actually they're hangar doors, and they slide up. So it looks like just part of the mountain is sliding up and it would lead into a laboratory and there was a set of hangars there. Nine hangars all together and there was a flying saucer in each different one of them and they were all different. Right, straight down the road. If the reports of flying saucers and reverse engineering are true, then could the government be using Area 51 as a warehouse for alien technology? Regardless of what kind of secrets the military is hiding inside Area 51, it's clear visitors aren't welcome. This is as far as, far as we can go on public land. That's the first thing that strikes me. There's no fence, just a pair of signs. At first look, security at the base doesn't seem impressive. But soon, the complex layers of defense become apparent. I notice tripods on the hill, those are watching us. Cameras, they're looking down at us, they're looking at the road over there. You can't sneak by on this road. And if you miss that, you don't miss our friends up here on the ridge. Right. In the pickup truck. These guys are here 24 hours a day. Ground sensors, remote cameras, and private security around the clock. Yet the desert itself may still be Area 51's best protection. You know, when we came here, I expected to see a 15-foot barbed wire fence. There's no fence, just a series of these orange posts. These posts are the only uh, marker that you're required to have in Nevada to mark a boundary line. They don't need a fence here. They've got 13 miles of empty desert to protect the base. Well, it's, the sign's pretty typical. Warning, restricted area until you get to the bottom. Use of deadly force authorized. So we're actually three feet from being in a situation where we could be killed. Doesn't it make you wonder what's in there that, that it has to be so secret that they'd kill? Could it be true alien visitors are being held at Area 51? Airing for the first time on network television, this video purportedly shows a live extraterrestrial on the base. He's apparently being observed by military workers through a glass partition. The source of the tape is a man who goes by the name of Victor. He won't reveal his identity for fear of retribution. Victor says the video was smuggled out when material from the base was being converted from analog to digital. He discussed the video with an altered voice in this 1996 interview. Approximately twice a month, they sit it down for a session that generally lasts from three to five hours. Victor claims the alien arrived on Earth in 1989 and was subject to regular interviews. In this session, 
He says the alien becomes distressed. I like he's checking for hemorrhaging around the eye sockets and uh, in the nasal cavity. Victor believes the alien died in the mid-90s. We have no way to verify whether the video is authentic, but we'll take it to a creature effects expert in Los Angeles to test its plausibility. In the meantime, we scale a mountain in search of any sign of structures inside the restricted area. The point is to, to hug these orange markers. I don't even see the orange markers. Look, there's a, a, uh, yeah. a but, but we know the orange markers are to our right here. We're losing daylight and only have orange posts to guide us. One wrong step into the invisible border means we could be arrested. I see a structure off right. in the distance. What are we looking right. at there? That's the actual guardhouse. That's the actual gate within the uh, Nellis Range. So if you were to keep driving on the road past those signs and you got to that guardhouse, you'd be arrested immediately. We continue to climb upwards until we can't go any farther. Well, this is as high as we can get. It looks like we're at the end of our journey because I see your, what do you call them, camo guys? Yeah, the camo dudes. Are here. Yeah, some orange markers here. This is as far as we can go. This is where the border changes. I think our only option is uh, is to get in the air uh, during daylight, and uh, you know, maybe I'll be able to get a glimpse and uh, you know, get some idea of what's in Area 51. But we're going to need daylight and a chopper. Yeah. Coming up. Join us in the skies above the Nevada desert as we take you as close as you can get to the most infamous military base in the country. They now know who we are and where we are. That's correct. Is Area 51 the epicenter for a cover-up of alien life? Or is the base concealing earthly secrets that are much more disturbing? Find out what happened at Area 51 and what humans did. That's scary enough. When Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. The only people who know what happens inside Area 51 are the employees, and their identities, even down to the cleaning staff, are kept secret. That white bus with the darkened windows, we're told, ferries local workers from area around Area 51 who come here to work each day. Those not bussed in are flown in, shuttled back and forth on special unmarked planes. They fly on a private airline known over aircraft frequencies as Janet every morning from Las Vegas to Area 51. This surveillance video shows workers returning from Area 51 on private 737s. These are jets without any company markings. They just have a red stripe down the side. Signing on to work at the base means agreeing to a covert lifestyle. No one can even admit that they work there. Jonathan Turley, a litigator in national security cases, first learned about Area 51 in 1994 when he was contacted by employees who were gravely ill. You're basically told to go die. And they weren't supposed to talk to a lawyer and they weren't supposed to talk to a doctor. Despite having signed non-disclosure agreements, some workers told Turley they'd been exposed to toxic materials on base. One of them was a sheet metal worker named Robert Frost. He couldn't tell the doctors where he was working or what he might have been exposed to. They could have put him in jail for it. In 1994, I conducted this interview with Frost's widow, Helen. She told me about the first day her husband came home with symptoms. He walked in a door and he was screaming. I looked at him, his face was bright red, and all the skin was peeling off of his face. Turley filed a lawsuit accusing the military of poisoning Area 51 workers through blatant negligence by recklessly disposing of hazardous waste. They dug a football field-sized trench, and they would fill it every week with all types of hazardous and toxic wastes. And then they would just dump jet fuel on it and set it on fire. Though the base was operating in secret, Turley says the impact on some workers was difficult to hide. Many of them developed a strange condition that looked like fish scales on their body. This was taken now just before he quit in March of 89. And then he had these large sores on his back. He had those all over his body. Turley's clients wanted to know what they were exposed to, but suing for information was a Kafkaesque task. 
At the time, the government denied Area 51 even existed. At one point, I just told the judge, Your Honor, I can take you there. I can point you to it. You can see it. How can it not exist as a matter of physics, let alone the law? Turley says it wasn't until he obtained satellite photos of the base that the government finally acknowledged some operations in the general area. They believed that they lived in a special place that was not reachable by federal law, that even killing someone uh, it was just simply not something to be held accountable for. Eventually, Turley filed several lawsuits on behalf of sick workers. The legal battle lasted for nine years. Some of his clients died during this time. The lawsuits succeeded in prompting the government to start conducting environmental inspections on the base as required by law. And as a result, the court found one of the cases to be moot. Another one was dismissed for reasons of national security. In the end, Turley's clients got no answers and disclosure of the legal inspections prompted by the lawsuit was deemed subject to a presidential exemption. This means they can be kept from the public, and they have been to this day. This is a failure of immense proportions. It goes not just from the Air Force command at the facility, but extends all the way to the president himself. These were Americans. They had to be protected from their own government. Turley says all the stories about aliens at the base have provided the military with an ideal smokescreen. If everyone's looking for some galactic presence, they're not looking down on Earth for simple crimes. And so the government never really did try to kill the alien stories. They just wanted to kill the crime story. And so, public interest in Area 51 and its alien legends has endured. Tourists come from all over just to get a glimpse inside the border. There's all the signs and all the cameras watching you up in the hills and the guys in the trucks. It's like, okay, what do you really not want us to see that's back here? Like, what is it that you want hidden so well? Major land restrictions in the 1980s and 1990s have closed off nearly every reasonable land-based vantage point into the facility. So we concoct another plan. We really couldn't see anything from the ground, but we have another option. Uh, we've hired a helicopter, and we're going to go up and try to skirt around the restricted area and see what we can see. Campbell, please come in. The sky is also now the focus for investigator Glenn Campbell as he prepares to monitor activity in the restricted airspace above the base with high-powered surveillance cameras. I have three cameras recording 72 hours worth of video. These three specialized cameras will record continuously and capture anything unusual overhead, day or night. The idea is have Bald Mountain on one side, have this small peak on the other side. Looks nicer. As we await the results, I head off to do some aerial surveillance of my own. All right, Tom? I'm Tom. It takes several calls before finding a pilot willing to take us anywhere near Area 51. Well, these are restricted areas, and why they're restricted areas, they don't tell us. How close can we legally get? Well, uh, it's recommended that you don't get closer than about two miles to the border. Are we going to tell them what we're doing? No, no, we're not going to tell them. We're just going to tell them we're going to be doing some flying looking the area over if they ask. Let's do it. All right. Okay, here we go. Set, we overhear communications between air traffic controllers and the unmarked government commuter jets. Jet 267, no control radar contact, maintain the 15,000. That uh, airplane he's talking to is one of the jets. Like an aerial bus service. Once we've flown over the highest mountain, Area 51 creeps into view. I can actually see it from here. We're probably about uh, 10 miles from the border. But just as soon as the base is within sight, a warning comes over the radio. Helicopter 966 Sierra Hotel, you familiar with that restricted airspace? Three miles to your west. 966 Sierra Hotel, affirmative. I'll be turning now. I won't get any closer than two miles to the restricted airspace. Copy that. 
It's clear that again, like on the ground, we're being observed. We are as close as we will be allowed to go to Area 51. This place is so restrictive that we legally can't even point our cameras in the direction of the base. We're at a little over 8,500 feet. It's a beautiful, clear day. This is absolutely the best view that anyone will be able to get of Area 51 from outside the restricted zone. I'm going to be able to tell you what I see as I look out. There are, there are two what must be very, very large buildings, uh, aluminum roofs. They shine, uh, they shine very brightly. I, I can only surmise that they are hangars of some sorts. There are a number of lower-lying buildings. All of it seems to be along the, the edge of a dry lake bed. There is what appears to be a, a very long, long runway. Our investigation has revealed as much visible evidence of the base as legally possible from the ground and from the air. I'm guessing they're a little more comfortable uh, when we're leaving this area. More than likely. <laughs> and if we've learned anything, it's that the government is intent on keeping what's hidden inside this legendary military base a secret. After 72 hours monitoring the sky, our video surveillance captures some anomalies. An eerie desert storm sweeps through the area. A bright light floats along the horizon after dark. And then we discover this glowing disk in the corner of the screen. Upon examination, the light turns out to be a car driving on the desolate road. The disk, however, remains unexplained. Campbell says it could be the moon. When you come to the desert and you look up at the night sky, you see more stars than you would ever see any place else. When you look up at all those million points of light, you've got to be crazy to believe we're alone in the universe. Coming up, our investigation continues as we travel from coast to coast to analyze the evidence we've discovered on our journey. What will the purported alien interview video from Area 51 reveal? And could this mandible support theories of extraterrestrial life? It's, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. Answers coming up next on Inside Secret Government Warehouses. Our investigation into secret government warehouses culminates with analysis of the potential smoking guns we've uncovered. Does this video of an alleged alien interview at Area 51 reveal the truth about life beyond Earth? And could this mandible prove alien remains have been hidden on bases like Wright Pat for decades? We'll explore all the possibilities with top experts, starting with one of the most sought after creature effects artists in Hollywood. I'm looking for that one piece of footage that is undeniable, that, that I, I can't look at or other people can't analyze to death. Kevin Yeager designs creatures, aliens, and humans for a living, most notably Chucky from Child's Play and a nightmare on Elm Street's Freddy Krueger. Jaeger agrees to analyze the video using 25 years of experience in puppeteering and film. The first thing that I saw, you know, was an alien, and it actually looked uh, like it was alive. If you look closely, you can see there's a small little mouth. It kind of looks like it's, you know, pursing and moving like a natural mouth would. It's got big doughy eyes, it's got a big head, and it moves in a pathetic way, and you want to take care of it, you know, and suddenly your heart is involved. Just as Jaeger starts to identify with the alien, he spots questionable movement. There's some quick jarring movements that uh, every now and then see this little jerk bobble head that happens here, uh, right there, it's kind of a jerk bobble, and the shoulders move as well. A telltale sign, he says, that the alien is a puppet. It's the head movement that tips Jaeger off, and he uses this animatronic doll to explain. Now, if you go slowly, like it was first moving very slowly, you could kind of take all the bobbles out. But then once he began to get kind of tired or go into his, his sick state, he began to wiggle and jiggle like this. And then that's what it kind of gives it away. But when dealing with a life form we know nothing about, Jaeger admits anything is possible. Maybe the atmosphere here is different and the, and the pressure, and they can't handle it. And it's, it's the gravity is it, too hard on them, so they do bobble. Still, Jaeger says it looks like the setup is hiding something. The darkness of the videotape, uh, the fact that the alien is, is sort of back behind a desk, I believe that that is to obscure uh, a possible puppeteer behind there. 
Jaeger thinks the alien and the video are a hoax. But he says it wasn't a bad try. There's certain organic elements to it, and I can totally see why people would think this is real. Hoaxes do nothing but undermine efforts to get to the truth. With that in mind, we head to New York City to visit NYU dental anthropologist Shara Bailey. She has been studying the mandible we obtained during our investigation at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The jaw shape is what struck me first, because the shape of this jaw is very narrow in the front part, and, it, and then it kind of dips in here, and then it's very wide in the back. And, and this is very unusual so for primates. So it makes, primate. it, it makes this curve and then comes out. Yeah, it's kind of like an S curve, I guess you might call it. And certainly our, our teeth don't, and jaws don't do that. No, they don't. Dr. Bailey has 2,000 primate casts, one of the largest collections in the nation, and she's compared the mandible to every single one. Can you say with any fair amount of certainty that this is not from a primate? Yes, I, I, would, I would put my career on it that it's not from a primate. Although Bailey can't match the mandible to anything she's ever seen, her examination of the cast does reveal new information. The cast was made from a skeleton. And this is of a living person. Because, because we you, see the gum mm -hmm, here? Yeah, you can see the gum, and you absolutely can't see the gum here. The creature lost its teeth after it died. Uh, and there are also crypts. Uh, you can see that where, where the teeth might have been. The remaining teeth show it was an omnivore. It's something that eats both flesh and vegetables. And dimensions of the jaw indicate the size of the creature itself. This is a macaque, um, but it has a jaw, a, a jaw similar in size to this. And so whatever this creature was, it was the size of a small dog. And the skull size would be similar as well to match this? Yeah, there's a very good uh, correlation between jaw size and skull size. The cast has some characteristics that strike Bailey as peculiar, including signs of being scraped with a tool. It's definitely been modified. So that, that I can tell you. Whether it's um, authentic and it was modified for some other reason, I, you know, it's very hard to tell. She also questions the apparent human-like dental pattern which could disprove the notion that the cast came from an alien skeleton. If it's an, we're an alien and evolved on a different planet, totally separate from us, why would we ever expect it to have the dental pattern, the same number of teeth and the same types of teeth as a human? It's just, it's very odd. If in fact this came from another planet, how would you begin to really compare it to find out what it is? All I can do is, is, is compare it to living things on this planet. This mandible is not of any creature that comes from our Earth, that's for sure. This alleged alien artifact tied to our nation's most complex Air Force base may be just the tip of the iceberg of what the government doesn't want us to know. Could this be one of the many secrets locked away in classified government warehouses around the globe? And is there a real Warehouse 13? In the end, we can't say for certain what's below ground or hidden behind closed doors. What we do know is that there will always be information those in power don't want us to know about. And as a society, we have the right and the responsibility to keep asking, to keep pushing, to discover what they don't want us to know and why. I'm Lester Holt. Thank you for watching.